They're the people we hope never to need. But when an emergency occurs, they're all we depend on. Um, it's an emergency. Tell me exactly what's happened. I'm going to tell you how to stop the bleeding, OK? Filming with 999 call takers, emergency paramedics and their patients. This is the continuing story of the men and women of the HSE National Ambulance Service. That's the bits of this job I love. Great fun. Hey, 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 hey. It's OK. It's OK. This time, we see how in certain cases, it's the biggest response for the smallest of people. The little guy was nicely distracted from his condition by the fact that he's now sitting in a big, huge helicopter. And, and you could see he was still walking hard to breathe. How ambulance crews cope with a fall from grace. If it's going to hurt, you have to tell them. Because if I tell them it's not going to hurt, and then it hurts, that's my trust gone. So he has to trust me. Ready, three, three, two, one, two, three. And what happens when every parent's worst nightmare becomes a crisis call for help? How old is he? It's a totally different game when there's a child involved. 14 months. You really need to keep as calm as you can here, OK? For him, he is relying on you. There is two control centres across Ireland, Ballyshannon and Tallinn, Dublin. One control centre across two sites. Basically, us as emergency call takers, we can answer the phone to any part of the country. So I can be in Cork one minute and Dundalk the next minute. So we do the same job as the people up in Tallinn. So we take the same calls coming in. Uh, if you're ringing in, you get, depending on who answers, you get somebody from Boston or somebody from Tala. Basically, there's two centres there in the event that if something happens in one, that there is a centre to facilitate the level of calls for the country. So if there's a glitch on either side, there's no disruption to patient care. Here in Ballyshannon, we dispatch the northwest and the west of the country, along with some other areas from time to time. We have a, a lovely team here too as well, so... Yeah, it's Bally Shannon, by a long way. Yeah, easy. Bally Shannon's a much better call centre. No, I'm only joking. They're <laughs> equally fantastic. Well, we do call ourselves the A-team, so... Oh, Bally Shannon. <laughs> Thanks, ECAS caller. Please repeat the phone number you're calling from. Now, caller, what is the address of the emergency? People sometimes say that your children are just small adults, and the fact of it is that's not true. Uh, children are unique in their own right, and when it comes to giving medications and dosages and stuff like that, you really do have to get it right. Yeah, I suppose your head does go into overdrive a bit more than what it would if you heard it was an adult, because I suppose adults are second nature to us, we're adults ourselves. Now you say there he's on the trampoline. Is the trampoline in the back garden or the front garden? So we're inside in the base having a chat, and listen, the radio went off. So I went down into the ambulance to get the details. Mm -hmm. So the emergency dispatcher then gave us the, the call details that it was a 10-year-old uh, while he was after falling off a trampoline. I think the, the thing with kids is to reassure them and to gain their trust. And once you have their trust, they're fine after that. You know, that's half the battle. Mm -hmm. It's the, it's, it's kind of getting them on side really is the trick. And again, that's not something that you can learn out of a textbook. Oh God, love him, I can hear him there. Poor wee mice. People don't actually realize that when you hear someone in pain, you tend to feel their pain as well. And you go through the motions with them. And it, it, it's, it's upsetting to us as well. Yeah, the lads will be well equipped for them whenever they come up there. They'll know exactly what's happening, all right? Because all the information that you're giving me is being relayed straight to the crew that's going out, OK? And the mum was very distraught, but yet calming at the same time because she talked him through everything. She treated him like an adult, told him the ambulance was coming. Poor little kid. I know, 10 year old. Oh, be distraught, an open fracture. Yeah. When any of us hear it's a child, I suppose, yeah. thank God we don't deal with a lot of paediatrics compared to adults. Dave, it's an open fracture. Okay. So um, I suppose we bring some dressings with us and the, the small vacuum splint. On the way down to the call, I was conscious of working out the medication amounts that I was going to give him, the dosages for his age group. Yeah, how are you? Good. 
Are you mum? Feline, I think he fell as he came off. No. And just then. Put the hand down. Straight he like. fractured the arm, but it wasn't just a regular fracture. The bone had come out through the skin. And first kind of thought really was to give him some pain relief, you know, to take that fear out of the, the whole experience. Right, so what we're going to give him is fentanyl. It's an opiate. Um, it's going to pain relief very quickly. Okay. It is kind of short acting enough. Okay, so. The big thing with paediatrics is to get down to the same level as the child. Talk simply with them, but be truthful as well, because if you tell them something isn't going to hurt and it does hurt, then they're not going to trust you for the rest of the call and they won't want to cooperate with you. Feel anything that's going to take away the pain? So you won't feel anything, all right? Ready, so you take a big sniff now. Ready, one, two, three, big sniff. Big sniff, Lee, come on. Okay, good man. Now, I'm going to do the same on the other side, all right? I want you to let me know when the pain goes away, okay? Dave has more medicine here if the pain yeah. isn't gone away yet. Um, no, no. Intanox is a quick acting pain relief. It's exactly the same as what women in labour get uh, inside in the hospital, but it wears off very fast. But if you're keeping it topped up, it'll keep walking. How about we give this to mum? And mum can see this to you for a minute. <laughs> none, none from mum herself, though. I'd love some now. I presume it's the trampoline secure, yeah? No, we can move it if we wish. If we can move it, we can roll it back. It's just the leg is in the way. Everything has to be done slowly, because if you do things fast, it's just going to increase their pain. So even though it seems that you might be a long time dealing with the patient on the call, it's for the right reasons. Um, you're taking your time, you're doing it properly, and you're causing the least amount of distress that you can cause to the, to the child. Now, Liam is going to hurt you for a second, my love. I'm sorry, OK? But we'll get you out as quickly as we can, OK? We had to get him off the ground. Uh, he didn't want to move. Obviously, you know, it was going to cause him extra pain. But I think with kids, when you're honest with them, if it's going to hurt, you have to tell them it's going to hurt. Because if I tell them it's not going to hurt and then it hurts, that's my trust gone. So he has to trust me. It's important for him to trust me. Ready? Three, two, three. One, two, three. Well done, well done, well done. Good man, that's it. No, good boy, well done. Hold on now. All right, Pet, OK, we're going to give him some more pain relief now, OK? Didn't really want him to see the wound. You know, obviously that was going to be alarming for him and also the amount of blood that was on the ground when we got him up you know it gave us good indication as well of the injury a public in germany okay take good deep breaths on good deep breaths fill up them lungs that's it good man keep going seeing a protruding bone it's not nice that it'd be called a distracting injury but obviously the training then kicks in so you wouldn't just focus on the injury you have to do a head to toe survey and see uh, is there any other injuries no and bend in the middle now okay one two three good man good boy well done that's it. What's wrong with my arm? It's broken. You broke your arm. You're going to have a cast that all your friends can sign. <laughs> uh, I feel better. Yeah. You feel better already. <laughs> we had a splint, so we got him up off the ground. Put the splint on the wound. Gave him some more pain relief. Don't be moving yourself now because you'll only hurt yourself. That's it. I have more marshmallow ice cream after the bomb. I think you could. I'll take it with anything you want, I'd say. After this, yeah. Give <laughs> a 200 euro thing. Wow. I might be pushing it a small bit. <laughs> one. Alrighty, one, two, two three. Up. Oh, no, I want to get it. No, you're okay, you're okay, you're okay. You're okay. You're okay. No. okay. Good boy. Have Weather you ever been in an ambulance before? <laughs> no. No. First time. We can't leave you dry. Yeah. Let's do anything. No, so. that's a big step. Can you manage? Well Good done. Good boy. Oh, I know. Come in here, la. Sit up here for me. Good man. They are? She is. Yeah, we'll let mom in there now. That's it. No. Straighten up. One, two, three. That's, that's it. it. Well done. Oh. <laughs> the rest of the week. It's the week. rest of the week, yeah. Just tomorrow. Is that instead of the 200 euro? I can't wait to be on TV. Yeah, so we grew up in syrup. Uh, it's actually just 10 year olds, 27 kilos. Okay, are we going to be on TV? All right, bro, off the bus. Ah, thank you. Just, just to take oh, away. What's the pressure with this? I know, but it's like a splint, it's like a cast. Okay, now will I get you to hold this with your right hand again? And you take as much of it as you want. Now, off we go. Okay. Thanks a million. Did I just see a smile? That laughing gas working yet? That was thought to be. Oh yes, yeah, you are. Yeah, the camera's behind you recording. And there's another one up here. See? He was very interested in the cameras and everything else that was going on. Mad chatty, forgot about the injury. Telling us all about school and his holidays and his favourite food. There's no point in booting up these roads, he'd be in too much pain. She's not. When we get onto the main road, it'll be fine, you know, you can catch up. The tip away, yeah. Right, but 
do you know what now when we get into Carragher line we'll be off this bumpy road and you won't be in as much discomfort do you want to try another little bit of the gas there you go there was no major urgency with the transports we had no lights and sirens on the way back and really as well that's our that's our bread and butter you know these calls where we're not rushing anywhere are the majority of what we do could have been worse you could have hit your head off the floor off the ground couldn't you yeah I think Denise's lessons have to do because they're absolutely that's buzzing. Now, there's a story to tell your friends next week. We headed for the CUH hospital and um, en route we would have radioed them just to let them know that it was a paediatric coming in. With a fractured, an open fracture of the lower arm, he's alert and stable. It's just to let them know as they may need to get the procedure room ready by letting them know that there's usually the orthopaedics would be there um, and that you're seen more or less straight away when you go in. Small bump here now going in the gate. That's the end of the bumpy road. Am I going to be an emergency this time? Yeah. Because it's an emergency, we have to get that arm seen to and get it fixed. I'm just going to take off this one here over your shoulder, OK? No. Well, thanks for the spin. You're welcome. Lovely. We hardly let you there. <laughs> we might think about it. It's not going to fall, I promise. No. Perfect, thank you. Now, off we go. I think he was distracted. Something that certainly helped us on call, as well as the pain relief, was the fact that the TV cameras were there. Yeah, I think he loved it. Maybe he has a career in television ahead of him. Kids can be uh, the best call that we get, or they can be the worst call that we can get. Yeah. You want to take off the outer jumper? Yeah. I think I speak on behalf of all my colleagues around the country, not just the ambulance service, but the Gardaí, the fire service, the emergency departments. The kids are the ones that will floor you. You have the most beautiful brown eyes. Yeah. yeah. We've had kids that have died on us um, in houses or not in the back of the ambulance, but uh, they're the ones that even, you know, as the years go on, they're the ones that will come to mind. They're, they're the ones that, um, when I'm finished this job, there are some of them that I'll never forget and they're always the kids. They're the tough ones. High five. Good boy. Now, here we go. Um, Kids shouldn't get sick. Unfortunately, they do. Yeah. Thanks, you Cass. Call your 2 the ambulance service. Will you repeat the telephone number you're calling from, please? OK, stay in. OK, OK, sorry. It's it's a totally different game when, when it's when there's a child involved. There has been, yeah, um, there has been some tough calls. Um, It's, it's one thing that I really think, especially if you have kids, that a call taker uh, will really hit them. When the phone rings and you hear a mother screaming, you mightn't even have had an address, you mightn't know what's going on. You might just hear them mention my baby or you might hear the word baby. Them very tough calls. But again, um, did I do the best I could do? Yeah, the kids, they're always, always tough ones to deal with. Even for people that, you know, have kids or don't have kids themselves, you're always going to relate to someone that you know. You need to stop shouting and just calm down for me while I get this address, OK? All right, it's most important that we find this. As at the end of the day, if you cannot get a phone number and an address, what you see it to them? It's tough because you generally find whoever's on the phone to you, they're always a lot more panicky when kids are involved. So it's harder from our end, even from trying to get numbers, to trying to get addresses, to trying to find out, find out exactly what happened. OK, well, that's OK. Let him have the fit. All right. OK. All right. So what's your name? So if their name is Martin, you might have to say, Martin, I need you to slow down. And if that doesn't work, you might have to say it again. Use repetition just to get them to actually calm down enough 
to give us the information in the order that we needed. Jennifer, okay, so Jennifer, you need to keep calm for him. I need you to repeat that. Well, you have to. You need to keep calm for him because he's relying on you. You have to tell them why. And in the case of with a young child, you know, a young child is going to feed off the reaction of the parent. You always think of your own family. Um, and I know there's been a few nights we've actually gone home and my young kids have been in bed and you walk into the room just to make sure... The, the address was just near impossible to get, get hold of. Uh, she was just too upset. Do you, do you know your air code? And that'll give me a, a, a direct match on your house. Yes? OK, no bother, nice and slowly. Luckily, in this case, she had the air code in front of her. And like that, she gave me the air code and her exact house plotted straight on my map. The difference and it's made with getting locations for people is, is, is huge, absolutely huge, because we don't, as call takers, have local knowledge um, because we're answering for the whole country. I'm going to ask you a few quick questions. I said, just keep calm, control your breathing there, OK? I've got help organised as we speak and I'm going to help you. I might be very straight to the point when I'm on a call and I will bang through because I know how important it is to get an address and I will get straight to it. I can hear him breathing and he's breathing which is the main thing so but you need to calm down and I'm organising your help. Are you with him now? You're trying to keep the caller calm. Now in your head you're thinking it could be a seizure and especially if they say that the child's eyes are rolling that they're frothing from the mouth. Um, so we start the, the seizure protocol and the questioning. How old is he? 14 months. Jennifer, you really need to keep as calm as you can here, OK? For him, he is relying on you. Is he awake? Part of our training is actually learning calming techniques and diffusing the situation. Um, and it's so, it's actually, it's vital um, in our role because when someone rings and they're screaming down the phone at you, it's impossible for us to hear what they're saying. That type of call with, with a mother and a young child who's never had her young child sees before. Uh, I can only imagine how scary it is. But you're trying to keep calm, keep her calm, tell the dispatcher what's going on, put in the notes and get help from a supervisor if necessary, like, you know, to get somebody else out there, like if you get a CFO group or something, if there's anything close by. Good, that's brilliant. So he's coming back around. Is he breathing? He is. Lovely. That's brilliant. Jennifer? That's OK. He's... he's Jennifer, is there anybody else in the house with you? Sometimes we have to repeat things a number of times, you know? Sometimes if they're roaring and shouting at you, I just tell them to stop, like, you know, it's not going to make the ambulance come any quicker. Was his whole body shaking? OK, all right, did he have more than one fit in a row? The more they keep shouting at me, like, you know? I'm not delaying help. The paramedics have already been alerted. They're already in the ambulance, going down the road towards you, OK? But I'm here to help you now. So, just listen to me for a second. I'm going to give you some instructions, OK? Now, if he starts to fit again, don't do resuscitation. Don't hold him down or put anything into his mouth. OK, Jennifer, listen to my voice. Once you can calm that situation with them, you know you can then give good care to the, the actual patient himself. OK, remove the tracksuit top and the tracksuit and just leave whatever's underneath there on him, OK? Take a few layers off him to let him cool down. OK. I don't think he's fitting because I can hear him crying, OK? Which is good, all right? If I hear a child who's just had a seizure start to cry, to me, straight away it tells me the child's breathing and straight away it tells me there is some sort of consciousness to the child there as well. And those are the two most important things, as far as I'm concerned, when there's something like that happening over the phone, is the person conscious and breathing. All right, you're doing really, really well, Jennifer. They're coming to you on blue lights and sirens as quick as they can here, all right? OK. Remember, remember to try and keep it together for him because he's going to sense if you're upset and it's going to upset him more. And to then reassure the mother, listen, OK, he was seizing, but listen to him, he's crying at you. That's brilliant. The most common seizures would last 60 seconds, so normally things are starting to calm down and, and they're good. And once they see their baby is coming around or their baby is breathing again, then they're breathing too. We're all breathing, so it's, it's good, it's good. 
Yeah, okay, that's okay, that's normal, all right? If he's had a seizure, he's going to be tired and he's going to be distressed, okay? A lot of the time, people, they're, they're, they are panicked at the very start. And we find once we get into the questioning, you get a rhythm going, you know, when you ask the question, they'll give you an answer and it's fine. And then we give the instructions. And it's usually after we give the instructions that they can actually start to panic again a little bit. So Jennifer, just try to remember, we, when, when the crew arrive, we can fall apart then. Try your best to stay strong for him because he'll sense if you're upset. I know it's a scary thing to see, but you're doing, you're doing brilliantly. You're doing really, really well. The paramedic will, will give him a really good check out before they do anything at all with him, okay? I'm lucky I have kids, and one of the, the positive sides of this job is that you actually appreciate what you have. So like, if I can walk out here at the end of my shift, I am extremely lucky if I can go home and hug my babies. If you wanted to pick him up and give him a cuddle, I'd say it's probably okay. I don't think he's going to go into another fit there. It doesn't sound like it anyhow. He might, he might like to have a cuddle from you. I know personally I'd use a technique that if the ambulance, if it's a rural call and the ambulance is maybe 20 minutes away, what we do try and do is that if the caller is getting panicked again, give them little jobs to do. So get them to open the door, make sure they have the lights on outside, maybe put a car outside with the hazard lights. Perfect. Now, can the dog, is the dog going to, is the dog able to get to the paramedic if the paramedic comes into the, into the, the garden? Yeah. Will he not? Okay, that's perfect, Grant. Lick him to death, will she? <laughs> Thankfully, a lot of the time, you know, it's not a bad outcome. They're hurt, but it's not life-threatening. Now, he looks to be just coming to the end of your road, so we'll be turning up it now in a second. Now, well, you did the right thing. The right thing to do was ring 999. You're dead right in what you did. No, well, you did brilliantly, because that's what we're here for. You get the highs and you get the lows, and you just really have to roll with it and just, you know... Sorry. Okay, I'll let you go, Jennifer. Well done, all right? You're very welcome. No problem. Bye-bye, bye. Okay, thank for air codes. I don't care what anybody says about how much was spent on them. That got that car right to the house because she couldn't give me directions for loving her money. I get on great with Andy. I have to say there's, there's very few people I don't get on well with. I enjoy coming into work and having a bit of a giggle and doing my job and taking the serious parts as they are, as serious as you can. Okay, gonna have to put up your window. Gonna have to use aircon. Working with Alison is a great old crack. Alison has this uh, unique dry wit, which uh, I think is fantastic to see. Yeah, we should fit by their breathing. There's an obvious uh, height difference as well, which makes it interesting when I work her, because I'd be a bit on the short side, and Alison would be a bit on the taller side. Good partner to have for uh, 12 hours of a shift. Some people just get terrified when they see us coming behind them. We're a big yellow box of blue flashy lights, and we make a hell of a lot of noise. If we have a serious patient on board, we're traveling at a nice continuous speed, but we kind of hope to keep that speed because if I'm driving, I know my partner's in the back attending to a patient and I don't want to be causing any sudden jolts or movements or sudden stops. I think really we need a bit more education in the country about it. I can't say that I blame any drivers for what they do because I think people just literally panic. I don't think ever anybody does anything maliciously, but it does cause us to be more cautious, to give more room, to trying to be second-guessing what's going to happen in front of you before it actually happens. If I'm driving the ambulance and we're taking somebody away who's quite sick, I would make it really clear to the family that we don't want any accidents on the route to hospital. We're going to drive at a speed that we're safe to drive at and we've been trained to drive at, but we don't want them following us and normally I'll send them on ahead and then meet us then at A&E. So it kind of takes that danger element out of it.
So uh, well on shift with myself, uh, or well on shift. So <laughs> I don't shift with myself. So me, myself, and I were at a call, and uh, Irene was there, and uh, <laughs> uh, stop the lights. Right. Roll on the baby. I think it's baby brain. Maybe that's what it is. That's what it is. Yeah. Oh, we're having first time at the moment trying to think of baby names to go with O'Toole. Tom. No. But don't do what I did to somebody. And they were saying, yeah, my wife is coming up with crazy names. And I went, well, as long as it's not. Oh, yeah. Doo -doo 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 -doo. And he looked at me and he went. name. Jesus, that's the name. How? And I was like, because I just think it's the most stupid name. It's a cross between this name and What's that name. What's the stupidest name? name? First thing comes to your head. I can't say it. It goes on to tell you people know who I'm talking about. Thanks, Ecos. Call you through to the ambulance service. What's the phone number you're calling from, please? Okay, and what's the address of the emergency? Okay, tell me exactly what's happened. Okay, right, I'm just going to ask you a few questions while the ambulance is on the way out to you, okay? Right, is there any serious bleeding? So while on shift with Alison, we got a call for uh, a trauma. And again, you, you don't really know exactly what it is till you get some details. And now I'm going to tell you how to stop the bleeding. So listen carefully to make sure we do it right. The first initial details we got was that a, a male patient had had a, a hand injury in, involved with a lawnmower. They're not the most unusual calls to get, but they certainly are ones that make you think because you could have a body part trapped in a piece of machinery. Again, the details that we get over the radio sometimes are as the call is coming in, so the details can be quite sparse. So we didn't have a whole load of information of how much damage had been done or any past medical conditions was he on blood thinners. And how, how much of your finger have you cut off? So en route to the call we are, you know, we're suspecting possible blood loss, extensive trauma, and the fact that the patient himself might be in a stage of shock, both from the mental shock of having an injury and the physical shock of maybe possible blood loss. Just like I just have a trial bag for the minute. Okay. Hello. How are you doing? We turned up to the house and we were met by this very cool, very collected gentleman who had his finger in a bandage. Did I fight with the lawnmower, had you? Yeah. Good man. The patient was being cared for by a neighbour uh, just inside the front door of the house where he had been seated on the stairs. Okay, is it just the one finger? Yeah. Okay, keep that covered up for a minute. Um, it's a fairly clean cut, but do you want to walk out to the ambulance here with us? We assessed him quickly in the house and then decided to bring him on out to the ambulance and get a look where we had better light and more sort of sterile equipment out of the ambulance that we could uh, assess his injury. I went over to the garden. He reckoned I wouldn't find it, but I went over to the garden. I found the top of his finger and we just took it with us. You can sit up here and get a look at your finger. While we're here, we in may here. as well have a look. Yep. Now. Once we brought him out to the, to the ambulance, we explained that we needed to have a quick look and make sure that you know, there was no extensive blood loss and that there was no sort of dirt in the wound or anything that would affect uh, future treatment of it. I found a little bit, but it's tiny. Brilliant, right. Brilliant. Pop your hand out flat there onto the bed for me. That's it is, amazing. Well, a bit of the bit. A bit of it's the kind bit. of shredded. This gentleman had cut the top of his finger off and he literally taken it off at an angle, so down through the soft tissue of the pad of his finger, leaving his nail intact, but he had exposed the bone and possibly just chipped the bone as well. There wasn't a whole amount of blood because it was a very clean cut. Obviously, it's a blade that had done it, so it wasn't that it was pumping blood or it was that, but it looked really nasty and like kind of it. You don't like to see bone exposed. Nobody likes to see that. It's not pleasant, but he was very cool. Now, tell me this, sir. Right. Are you normally fitting well? Yes. So, relax your hand down there. This catches the water, OK? Have you much pain at the moment? No. Okay. No pain. Okay, well that's good. Any diabetes or anything like that? No. How did you do it? Was it just that you were trying to get something out, or? Uh, there was there was dog or cat poo on the on the wheel. Uh -huh. the, it off. the blade caught you. The big risk, I suppose, is infection with something like that because of the dirt to the blade and the grass and all that. I'm going to again. take a few vital signs off you. So I'll be taking your blood pressure and stuff. Okay. okay. Now, if you close in, all fingers bar the, oh, the damaged one. I know you're giving the middle finger, but don't worry about that. Yeah. You must have got a fright, did you? Now, you can pop that hand down. Yeah, that's that on. That's going to get tight on your arm, OK? OK. So during the sort of summer months or even the, the spring months when the weather starts to improve, we do see minor traumas 
on a regular basis due to the equipment that's been used in around the weather so like that cutting the grass cutting the hedges uh, using equipment that might not have been used from one end of the year to the other now it's meant to be tight to stop you bending it yeah. that's why we wrapped your second finger in there as well all right yeah that's all right you get a lot of gardening type injuries i've had people fall off the roof of sheds with using strimmers we've had guys falling off the gable end of houses because they were painting and the ladder wasn't long enough and he put it up on blocks you have no pain at all at the moment? No. Well, that's good. I did get slightly weak though, um, a few minutes after it happened. See, it is. In about fright, I'd say. About five minutes after it happened, I got a bit weak. He did complain of feeling quite faint, which is quite a normal reaction to somebody who's experiencing pain uh, or trauma. And even from the, the psychological thoughts of the fact of how he might end up with missing a piece of his finger and that. A few stickers going on you now, okay? And relax the arm okay. back down again. This is just to save you holding it, and if we hold it up in the air, it might stop bleeding a bit quicker, all right? That's fine. You don't have to explain to me. You know what you're about. I trust you. It's kind of par for the course when you get something like that, an, an outdoorsy injury in a garden. Expect anything. So you don't know what you're going to see. Yeah. Sorry, the peak of your cap. Yeah, it's a long peak. It is. Good for the sun, though. That's, that's why I've it on, yeah. See, this fella here, he needs a cap like that. Look, look what he did this morning. Now, I don't think they'll reuse it, but it's more just to show them how much you've lost. Yeah. We'll pop the bit of skin in here, all right? I wouldn't say that anything was reattached yeah, with that. I'd say that he'd end up with no pad at the back of his finger, but the skin would heal across it eventually, yeah. Did you have your lunch today? Yeah. What did you have for lunch then? We do a full assessment, so we're taking all these vital signs into account and we'd be checking blood sugars and monitoring the patient if they hadn't eaten, that maybe he could have taken a weakness or whatever. Are you, are you living alone? I don't know, yes. We'll know where to come next time we're hungry, huh? You sound like a good cook. I'll leave you guys to it. Okay. Um, Neighbour has the keys and he doesn't. For those that might see the wound, it looks quite traumatic, quite serious, and then the amount of blood as well that might be lost sometimes looks quite uh, upsetting. However, experience, we look at it ourselves, we can sort of tell whether the trauma is extensive or is it something that's going to require maybe specialised treatment. But in this case, I didn't feel it was required, so we just transported it to the hospital. All right, Andy? Yep. Uh, what are we? Left hand, middle finger. You didn't pass out at any stage. No, just you, you just got weak. Well, it's just your, it's your body's just a response to something going wrong. That, you know, it's probably better to be lying down because your blood, your blood floats around better if you're lying down. Uh, and that's why sometimes if you're upright and something's going a bit haywire, your body tells you to lie down. The best way I can do that is to make you feel a bit dizzy. And you've been through a bit of a trauma there anyway. Yeah, but nothing that you can't bounce back from. So we got him into the ambulance. He was very lucky that he hadn't lost more of his hand. And I think he'd put his hand in to clean the blades. So he was a lucky man. No pain at all. A hardy man. I doubt there'll be going trying to attach the skin. It's very small. But the type of wound it is, I can't see it giving you much problems bar stopping the infection, get it cleaned, and maybe some form of stitching just to keep it all together. I was a mechanic beforehand, so I used to fix cars for a living. Yeah. Now I fix people. Yeah. <laughs> Come on down to me. Put your hand on the bar there on the way down. We transported him down to St. Vincent's Hospital where he was assessed and from follow-up the piece of finger wasn't viable, the piece that was collected uh, and they just sutured it and treated it. So he didn't lose any use of the finger but he did lose the, the, the small tip. About four years ago I got involved in the emergency air medical service which is based in Athlone and I'm seconded to that on a rotational basis. It's a completely different environment, working with the Air Force crews, working in the back of a helicopter with much sicker patients, landing at various sites around the country, and then interacting with National Ambulance Service colleagues who I've never met before, and suddenly we're in the middle of a major medical emergency. Uh, somebody's having a heart attack, cardiac arrest, a road traffic accident, a big trauma. So that's enjoyable and challenging and fun, while also dealing with very serious issues. The 
The room obviously being a much larger room than it was in Townsend Street and dealing with much larger areas, it's much easier to see what everybody else is doing now. In particular for Aeromedical. Aeromedical can sit and they can scan every call coming into the whole country and see is this a call that's going to need a helicopter or not. Okay, thanks Doctor. Bye bye. Hello. How are you Paul? A uh, five-year-old there, um, having a severe asthma attack. Resps of greater than 30, between 30 and 40. SpO2, 92%. Tachy at 125. Oh. Unable to complete sentences there, so. He, he, di he did say that it, it would benefit the, the t response back into Galway. Yeah, no, definitely, yeah, that sounds appropriate, yeah, so. PDLZ in Clifton, so. Uh, yeah, I'll go showgrounds, one, 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 five, nine or. 1159 Alpha Charlie. So, five year old severe asthmatic attack. Okay, uh, I said we're 40 minutes flight time and we'll be airborne there in the next six or seven minutes. Super stuff. We talked in the air, so. Cheers, thanks, Shane. Bye bye. young boy in the doctor's surgery had uh, multiple asthma attacks uh, doctor had prescribed his medications and seen the nearest ambulance as a distance away so just warranted a young lad in a lot of distress family may be upset so we could call to, to utilize the AP in their core moment too the call was originating in a doctor's surgery in Clifton and the GP is concerned about this little boy November half, November half to Air Corps 112, that's all received, 3 3 minutes to run to 1159 or Alpha Charlie. And Paul, if you're ready for clinical details, there, I'll pass over. So I just asked the dispatcher to contact the GP just to get a, a more thorough idea of what was going on. So uh, they came back to me pretty quickly. Doctor advised there he is, uh, he's tacky at 125, resps are 30 to 40, and sats at 92% on room air. Has been given 2.5 of salbutamol, uh, neb. To some effect, but not great. And you was looking for yourselves there due to the, the short flight time back into Galway. Over. Number five, and that's all received. ETA for the ground crew. Over. Uh, six Lima zero five is showing approximately two zero two zero minutes to run. Um, I am going to get to the switch on to MB Connect for your updated ETAs on route. Over. I try not to get too emotionally involved en route to the call or at the call because you need to keep your professional distance for want of a better word. Dealing with, with children are difficult because doses change so a dose for an adult for a certain medication is the same. Children depending on their age then the doses get bigger or smaller so we need to keep a clear mind for stuff like that but also dealing with a child you're definitely going to have concerned parents, uh, guardians, carers so it, it adds a lot more to the call, a lot more to think about. The drive time from Clifton back into Galway is twice three times the length of the, the flight time for Air Corps 112, so it would make sense. November off and November off to 6 Lima 05, go ahead with your message, over. That's all received. Uh, if possible, maybe a little update there for uh, the advanced paramedic on the helicopter. Uh, break, break, Air Corps 112, do you copy over? Break, break, 6 Lima 05, did you copy the ETA over? Roger that, all copy. Uh, Kevin, if you're checked, you're open. Roger. Stop by and you're cleared to open your own time. Roger. And open the door. door open and secure, check your port. 
we got over Head Clifton just as the ambulance had arrived at the scene. So we, we landed in a, one of our pre-designated landing sites in the middle of Clifton town and we shut the aircraft down. Initially just looked at the child before I got to speak to anyone and you could see he was still working hard to breed but he was better than he had been when he had arrived at the GP surgery. Started getting a handover from the GP. Acutely unwell, uh, shortness of breath, wheeze and cough, sudden onset. Discussed some more treatment options with the GP. He had been considering giving him some IV hydrocortisone but hadn't done that. We had already drawn that up on the flight out to Clifton in anticipation of using it. Do you know what we have outside for you? We have a helicopter. Then obviously because he was a five-year-old, couldn't take him on his own, so needed to speak to mum and make sure that she was okay with that because the last thing we want in the middle of everything is mum to start getting freaked out by being at 1,500 feet in the air. So she was quite calm, very calm in fact. Brought them over, we loaded them into the aircraft. Did you ever get in a helicopter before? The first time. No. We'll get your, we'll your mum to sit in here for a minute while we're getting you sorted, okay? Get up, hop in here next to him. The little guy was nicely distracted from his condition by the fact that he's now sitting in a big huge helicopter and there's pilots knocking around trying to look cool and stuff and strapped him in, put him onto our monitor and yeah, he was, he's still working hard to breed but as I said, improved from what he had been. <coughs> okay, can I pop this on your hand? So like a little sticker. Give him some IV steroids. That improved them even further. Got everyone strapped in, made sure we were all strapped in, made sure control knew we were about to leave, and started heading for Galway University Hospital. It's a fantastic setup. To be able to drop an advanced paramedic basically anywhere in the country when needed and transport a patient to a critical care hospital within less than an hour in some cases. It's, it's a brilliant thing. It makes a massive, massive difference. Apart from monitoring the child, the flight was relatively uneventful until my crewman, Damien, on the flight decided to steal my thunder slightly and he asked our patient about teddy bears and did you have teddy bears? And I was like, this is a bit of a weird conversation now to be having. Have you got some teddy bears? You have. Might have a look back in the back here with all the medicine and see could we fight. Will you keep an odd teddy bear hiding back here? So Damien turned around and went into the uh, area where all the equipment is kept and produced a teddy bear. I think for a boy it's so good. Would you bite this boy for me? Of course, I was completely disgusted that I hadn't spotted the teddy bear that morning and I hadn't thought of giving the child a teddy bear, so I was now sitting in the corner going, mm, OK. You have to think of a name for him. Call him Damien or Paul. Took the little fella's mind off it. It took everyone, took mum's mind off things. The little fella was happy enough and he clung on to it and we haven't seen him since, so I presume his teddy bear is out in Clifton somewhere now enjoying the sunshine on the beach. On this occasion, our stowaway, which wasn't standard issue or part of the normal kit for Air Corps 112, and I actually still don't know where it um, originated from, but I know now where it's gone. Over three, stop the helicopter, we're going to shut down the, the engines, okay? Then we're going to bring you over to the, the ambulance there, and we'll bring you around and meet the doctor. Well, I don't know, I think we'll bring you home, will we? We bring you back home. You're after making a great recovery, aren't you? Fine. I definitely enjoyed the aeromedical aspect of the job. It's been a big challenge. Instead of getting into an ambulance, I was getting into a helicopter. But I've learned a lot from the airport in relation to communicating trying to be a better communicator. Because of the difficult conditions that we're in, there's a lot of radio traffic going on. There's people with helmets, so learning what information is relevant and what information can wait and be passed over at a later time. And then that's something that can be used when you go back on the road uh, to your ambulance with your partner. It's a fantastic opportunity, I'm delighted. I'm one of only a few APs in the country 
that have been able to do it. But I equally like to come back on the road, get back on the ambulance, go out, do the calls. That's what we're there to do. But then it's nice to go back to my two months on the, the aircraft and catch up. There's always things changing up there, so it's nice to go back and catch up on what's new.